Hi, hello, Wiffle Nation, and welcome to episode two of Around the World of Wiffle. I'm your host, Carl Coffey. Let's meet that panel. Representing Huntington Wiffle Ball, Josh Smith. How are you, Josh? Leave me, Carl. How are you? Super. Representing OCWA, Justin Tompkins. What's up? How's it going? Backyard Wiffle Ball League, Kevin Sickle. Hi. Yo. Nice flag. Thanks. And our episode one champion, Trent Steffies, welcome back, MNWAHRL. Hello and hi. You know the rules, four questions, everyone takes turns, going first, second, third, fourth. At the halftime, we'll do score update. After the fourth question, we eliminate two, and we have a secret question. Are you guys ready? Oh, yeah. Time. Josh Smith, you're leading it off. Great question idea. one. Josh Pitcher's hand, pitcher's poison, or neither. What do you prefer and why? You got 25 seconds. Pit- pitcher's poison because it's treated more like traditional baseball, whereas we throw the ball to first base. There's just a agreed upon place to throw the ball to get the easy out. It's very easy for everyone to understand that. I just think it's probably the less extreme version of that kind of a rule. Thank you. Tompkins. Uh- uh, I'm going with pitcher's poison as well. Um, I love the pitcher circle. Love that since we did it originally in NWA tournament. Um, pitcher's hand's just too easy to just have the pitcher just run into the outfield and get the ball and just be like, time. So it's way too easy. Um, pitcher's poison, you actually have to get it to a spot, much like first base in baseball. Sickle. Yo, I'm going to go on record and say I don't like either one. Because I'd rather throw to first base like real baseball, but since you're making me pick one, no, you can say neither. Pick, you can say neither. No, can say neither. no, no, no. Because mm-hmm. you know it's end of the lifestyle, and I know it's been discussed as, as a rule or whatever. But pitch is poison if I had to pick between the two. Why? Both are lame. Why? Why? Because again, like Tom Kid said, the guy could have the ball anywhere on the field and just call time. That's that's dumb. It's ridiculous. Steffies. Let's make sense. Negative. Um. My vote here is for HRL style. You have the base pass in between first and second, second and third. If the ball is hit within those base pass and then is fielded cleanly, then that's a ground out, you know? It's a way to get games going, and uh, it's, say, it's, it's, it's a leg saver for older dudes like that are in the HRL. So in a weekly league like that, man, I think that the HRL style is best. Okay. Moving on. Second question. Which second-year NWA tournament team will have the best sophomore campaign? WWF, Greater Auburn, or Leroy? Justin Tompkins, you're first. Uh, I'm going WWF. I think they're the obvious answer. I think Artem is an up-and-coming you know, potential ace in this tournament. Ted O'Neill is a very solid number two. they got other arms. Um, they do have a little bit of hitting. Uh, Gall concerns me. I don't even know if they'll make the tournament. And Leroy is due for a step back. Uh, they're managed by Tim. Are you worried about P.A. Tony's managerial style? Justin? Uh, yeah, but they got ten. Kevin, what do you got? All right, well, uh, I'm going with WWF as well um, for reasons I'll get to in a minute. Uh, Greater Auburn's a pretty good team, but I don't think they're going to be able to make a really big jump. Uh, as far as Leroy goes, they had a pretty good showing last year for them to one-up that. I don't think that's going to ha- happen. WWF, uh, like Tomkins said, has Artem, obviously plays in our league. And uh, P.A. Tony, believe it or not, uh, has a really good uh, baseball sense, and I think that's going to carry over pretty well the wiffle ball. He hangs around at our field quite a bit, and he really knows what he's talking about, and he really knows the game, and, and that's really going to help them. Plus, with the skill guys that they have, you know, they have Artem, uh, Bell is hitting, and Artem, when he's given a chance to hit as well, they're going to make themselves in the top eight, if not much better than that. Steffi's, what do you think? Um, well, I don't, I don't know who P.A. Tony is, and... For that reason and because Gall's not even going to make nationals, I'm going with Leroy here because I believe in Caleb Jonkman. I think that JT mentioned up-and-coming up aces in this tournament. Caleb Jonkman is the up-and-coming ace in this tournament. They all have one-year experience under their belt. They're going to come back even hungrier than they came in last year. Leroy. Josh Smith. I'm going to have to back up Trent on the Leroy thing. Uh... I don't know really enough about WWF to really contest that, um, and I, I don't see Gall qualifying either, but Leroy qualified in the top eight. No one counted them in on that. They know what to expect now, and they have youth, 
and they're already starting to combine a little bit with Griffleball and sort of collaborate on switching players within their own leagues. So there could be some talent development there to maybe preserve what they've done. I don't know if they'll be able to top a top eight finish this year, though. Thank you. Halftime score update. Justin Tompkins leads with seven. Josh Smith in second place with six. Trent has four, and Sickle has one. Third question. Should team hats be required for the NWA tournament? Kevin Sickle. Absolutely. As, as you see, I'm styling the BWBL hat from last year. We're going to be upgrading the threads this year. But it really adds to the tournament. It it adds to, you know, just the overall branding. And to be able to get your team out there and to get your logo and to show your creativity is really important to making this league something more than just, you know, our core group of people that are involved. Getting more people involved, having logos, having something to display is really important. Perfect. Trent. Um, I'm taking the opposite stance here. I don't think that guys should be required to have hats. Obviously, having hats is something that I'm really into and uh, something I encourage, but you should absolutely not require it because it's up to the managers and everybody to take that extra step to go the extra mile to look that much better. And uh, you don't need matching hats to win. Look at Skibby. Mm. Josh Smith. I'm going to go with no. I mean, it's really nice to have. It's an embellishment. I mean, Freaky Franchise and Whiffle and Southeast Michigan, they've all had some really cool um, hats that sort of brought their uniforms together, but that doesn't really necessarily equal success. Also, um, I mean, it's just an unnecessary cost in my book. I think people should focus more on their jerseys and developing their teams and things like that. But, I, I mean, it's a great element for blending the uniform together to cap it all off. Hey, <laughs> But I don't think it should be required because it's just – I'm going to waste watch here, and that just seems like a waste of money. It oh. shouldn't be required. All right. Justin, what do you got? Uh, I'm going with yes. Um, I think it completes the look, um, and I think looking good is important. The uh, old adage is look good, feel good, play good. Uh, um, I know Freaky Franchise has always kind of subscribed to that. We've always played well. Um, as far as the cost goes, cost depends on where you get them. I mean, you can get hats for as low as $14 a piece. We've done it, seen it. I mean, it can be done. So I think it should be just part of the uniform. Last question. Trent, you're going first. Should leagues have a do-over rule if a call cannot be agreed upon? Trent. Um, No, because this is a, you know, baseball has their set of unwritten rules. This is wiffle ball's unwritten rule. If you can't come to an agreement, you just do it over. You know, I don't, I don't see this as something that needs to be written down in a rule book, voted upon, something like that. I mean, not all of us are PWL, so we have to dispute close calls ourselves. And at the end of the day, a compromise of a do-over is just easier than fighting for, like, ten minutes about a call. Josh Smith. I disagree, but it depends on the circumstances. If your league is in its first year or second year, by all means, indulge in doing a do-over rule because you're still figuring out really how you're playing. If this is your fifth, sixth, seventh, so on year, you need to get your shit together and figure out what the rules are. Half the clauses in there. Some leagues have batter decides if it's fair or foul, so on and so forth. Have the maturity and the foresight to put those clauses in there to make sure that the game is seamless unless you have a few thousand dollars every weekend to put some umpires on the field. Tompkins. Carl. Oh, um, I, I agree with a lot of uh, Josh's points. Um, I'll just add kind of on top of that that um, league officials usually have to take kind of a step in that. Um, I know in OCWA, me and Ryan make a lot of the judgment calls uh, as far as fair and foul, you know, over the line. So, um, but if we're not there, usually batter can make that call. We've never really had a lot of issues with it. Um, as long as you, uh, as long as you keep your rules tight, you don't have a lot of conflict. Thank you. And sickle. Two overs are for little kids. <laughs> ah. <laughs> we're, we're all we're all men here playing this game. Some of us are. You know, depending on league formats, you're you're 12 and up, 16 and up, 18 and up, whatever. But that was when you know you didn't have anything organized. You're just playing, you know, in the backyard with your brother, or sister, and your and your your neighbors. You know, have rules. Rules need to be in place. Rules need to be followed. You know, whether you're PWL and you can afford to, to hire crazy umpires, 
or just like with us, I mean, we have league members umpire week to week, and if they're not available, then I step in because, you know, let's, let's be honest, the batter can't be trusted. We originally had that in our rules, too. But, I mean, you got to have some semblance of rule and order, and do-overs are, you know, again, baby stuff. All right, here we go. <laughs> I like it, Kevin. You did good that question, but not good enough. Kevin, you have 10 points. Fourth place, you're eliminated. Any last word? I think I got hosed because I was late. That's all I got to say. You did. See you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> in, thir- <laughs> in third place, our defending champion, Trent Steffies. Any last words? Yep, I called this. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are tied with 13 points since Josh is my co-host. I can't for- wait to see. To a- to I can't Josh- wait to see what question you have to hose me on, Carl. You want to go first or second, Josh? I don't care. Justin, right, who's what, the leader? You guys are tied. Justin, you want to go first or second? Oh. Um, I'll go. I'll go second. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Josh Smith. You got a minute. Actually, forty-five seconds. You got forty-five seconds. Is it okay for wiffle ball players to also play slow pitch softball? Josh Smith, go. I don't see why not. As long as it doesn't interfere. I, you, one way or another, you're going to decide which one is a priority. I ran to this in my league several times. Personally, I prefer in a league that I play in, that people do not play slow pitch softball. But at the same time, it can be a very effective recruiting tool. So it really depends on your circumstance. I've seen it go both ways. But if you're able to have your cake and eat it too, I see no reason why you shouldn't be able to do that, especially if you can use it as a recruitment tool to promote your wiffle ball league. But then there's some people out there that think, oh, slow pitch softball is the real fucking deal. And wiffle ball is for children. I'm like, sure, okay. And then... You show them a video of someone like Stephen Farkas throwing, they're like, wait a second. Yeah. I think maybe I found my new god. Nice. Justin, go. Uh, as somebody who plays both wiffle ball and slow pitch softball, I completely endorse uh, this for a couple reasons. Um, Josh mentioned the recruitment tool. Um, I've actually got a couple guys that play on our company team that are uh, going to come out and watch some Golden Stick the next time they come through here. Um, so it's just getting people out to the fields. That's important. Uh, the second thing is, is that I like to use it as wiffle ball spring training. Um, uh, heavier bats really help me out. Um, especially slow pitch league I play in OCWA, you know, slow pitch softball, very similar speeds. So you're just using a heavier bat. So you're getting around on that ball quicker, um, when you get through. So. All right. Justin Thompson's got five points that round. Josh Smith got eight. Justin, you're eliminated. Any last words? <laughs> no. Oh. That's Josh. All right. See you. All right, Josh. I'm sorry. I know you want to go to bed, but you got 30 more seconds. Any, uh, you know, last shout-outs for you? No, I'm just – this This makes it all worth it for getting humiliated on all the stem Joshes that I've endorsed so far and will in- continue to endure for a while. All right, I'll see I'll see you Wednesday when we interview Farkas. All right. See you, Mike. All right. That's episode two of Round the World Riffle. Talk to you next time. See you.